Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a very significant series for Seventh-day Adventists particularly, entitled The Three Angels' Messages. Remember, those are the messages found in Revelation 14, 6 through 12, and we're gonna, we've been looking at them in some depth. This is lesson number six for May 6 of 2023, entitled, The Hour of His Judgment. What does that mean? Well, we'll try to figure it out. Shall we begin with the word of prayer? Father, we bow now asking your special guidance as we discuss this challenging portion of scripture from Daniel and Revelation. May we correctly understand it and make it as clear as possible for those who are listening in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What do you think of when you, when you hear the words, the hour of God's judgment is mentioned? Jim? From the Bible study guide. Several years ago, National Geographic magazine described a forest in Yellowstone National Park in the United forest States. Forest fire. A forest fire in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. After it ended, forest rangers trekked up a mountain to assess the damage. One ranger found a bird literally burned to ashes at the base of a tree. Somewhere, excuse me, somewhat sickened by this eerie sight, he knocked over the bird with a stick. Then he stuck it. When? when excuse me. When he struck it, Three tiny baby birds scurried from under the dead mother's wings. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings. She could have flown to safely, safety, but had refused to abandon her babies. What a picture of the believer who is safe in Christ. The fires of God judgment burned themselves out on him excuse me on him at Calvary and all who are in Christ are safe forever beneath his wings from the Bible study guide for April 29 okay so what are we saying here we're saying Christ experienced what we call the second death the experience that the sinners will, will experience at the end so we have a chance He's the only one in the history of our world who's died the second death. If we want to know what's going to happen to sinners, have a look. That's what we're talking about. As he hung on the cross, how did Jesus Christ himself view the situation on Calvary? Carrie? From the writings of Ellen G. Wood, upon Christ as our substituted surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted a transgressor that he might redeem us from the condemnation of the law. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressed upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. All his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme, but now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, so let's notice this very carefully. What's happening here? Sin is separating he, him from the Father. Exactly, he cannot perceive the Father's presence. Okay, and he's being, that, that's what sin does, it separates us, okay? The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood stood rather by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, I have to interrupt again. What had Jesus been through so far? Physical beating. Crown of thorns, beaten until his entire black was bloody. He, he has been through, I mean, even go back before that, he sweat drops of blood in the garden, all of that, and now the fact that the Father is separating his beams of light and love from Jesus, he doesn't even perceive all that pain, 
all he can think of is, how can I be separated from my father? When we sin, we choose voluntarily to separate ourselves from the father, from God. Do we feel that kind of anguish? Okay, go ahead. Uh, where did I leave it? I was listening to this. Satan with his fierce temptations there. Satan with his fierce temptation to wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish with the sinner will, which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. What does that mean? Probation is closed. Christ died the death that the sinners will die at the end. Okay. That's the second death. Second death. It was a sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. That's from Mrs. White, Desire of Ages, page 753. Okay, let's talk about that for just a moment. When we talk about substitute, people have different ideas about what that means. In this case, it says, Jesus went through what should happen to every one of us. But if we choose to accept his plan for our lives, then this death, we look at it, we learn from it, so we don't have to go through. So in that sense, he is our substitute. Notice that Jesus suffered the pain and anguish. The Bible calls it the second death that sinners will feel as they perish finally. Remember that God's wrath is simply is turning away from those who do not want him anyway and have repeatedly rejected God's request to return to him and are running away from him as fast as they can, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. The judgment, which began in 1844 and is still in progress, which we call the pre-advent judgment, which was formerly called the investigative judgment, must take place before Jesus Christ returns a second time because, why is it necessary for this to happen before the second coming? Those who are judged righteous will be taken to heaven while the wicked will die and remain dead until they are raised at the third coming, which is after the millennium. So this is a separation point, right? So let's talk about how we get to that detail, those details in terms of timing. Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. I heard the other angel answer, it will continue for 2,300 evenings and mornings, during which sacrifices will not be offered. Then the temple will be restored. Okay, from our Good News Bible. Daniel eight fourteen refers to a period of 2,300 evenings and mornings. What is that talking about? That's what we're going to try to determine. That period of time is supposed to stretch to a time when the sanctuary will be cleansed. Okay. Dwayne. Each Jew clearly understood the meaning of the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. It occurred on the Day of Atonement, which was the Day of Judgment. Although Daniel understood the concept of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment, he was confused about the 2300 days. Okay, the word in Daniel 8, 14, translated cleansed, has a variety of meanings. The Hebrew word is nisdak. So our Bible study guide says, Translators have rendered this word nisdak mm -hmm. in a range of meanings, including restored, made right, purified, cleansed, justified, and vindicated. The Hebrew word nisdak likely includes this range of meanings listed here. Okay, so here's a, the, the Hebrew vocabulary, and especially back in the Bible days, was very limited. And so you, one word can be, stand for a number of different ideas. So we're saying there's a, there is a whole collection of words, all the ones words we read there, uh, that were included under the meaning of that one word. Even okay. in our language today, yes. which has we do it many all. more words, we do the same thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gordon, you want to jump in there? 
a free flow, continuing from the Bible study guide, a free flowing translation of Daniel 8, 13 and 14 might read, quote, at what point will the sanctuary be restored to its rightful place? When will it be cleansed or purified of sin? When will God's name be vindicated, his truth exalted, and all things be made right again? The angel answers, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel had read the prophecies of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 25, 11 and 29, 10, which we'll look at in just a moment, that the Jews would be allowed to return to their homeland after 70 years. He was praying to God that day would come very soon because he, Daniel, was already around 90 years old. So what prophecies was he looking at, Jim? Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. The Lord said, This whole land will be left in ruined ruins and will be shocking sight, and the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylonia for 70 years. And then in Jeremiah 29, verse 10, the Lord says, When Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise to bring you back home. From a good news Bible. Okay, so Daniel has read these prophecies. I'm sure he had them memorized. And he had, so at that time in the Bible here, in Daniel 9, we read about his prayer. We read his prayer recorded there about the seven-year prophecy. He says, God, you promised, you promised, and here's all, you know, this, this is, this is, your, your people are looking down on you because our land is in ruins. It's destroyed. It's, there's not, it's nothing but a pile of rubble. And, and what are people saying about you if your country looks like that, if your land looks like that? And he's praying, God, please do something. We have made big mistakes, but please do something for your reputation. Imagine his shock when God started talking about 2,300 days or years, and then 490 days or years out, uh, cut off for the Jewish people. Wow. The fact that God did not talk about the 70 years of captivity for his people and their return to Judea and instead talked about 2,300 days, years of, de or of delay caused Daniel to feel sick. sick. Daniel 8, 27. Is that mine? I think it's Carrie. Is it? Hmm. Carrie. Carrie. Oh, you know, man, off the rails. <laughs> Daniel 8, 27. I was depressed and ill for several days, and I got up and went back to the work that the king had assigned to me. But I was puzzled by the vision and could not understand it. That was so good from the Good News Bible. And I can tell you, we, you can't see this, you can't tell this from the English, but from the Hebrew, the words that are used here, when he says, I was puzzled, puzzled by the vision, the vision word here is the same exact word which is used in reference to the 2300 days, evenings, and mornings. And it's separate from the other visions of, you know, the kingdoms and the whatever, a different word is used. Okay, Daniel 9 records Daniel's prayer to God and the angel's response to try to answer the questions that have been raised by the troubling vision of Daniel 8. Daniel 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 19 and 22 through 22, and said, I am showing you what the result of God's anger will be. The vision refers to the time of the end. The ram you saw, that has two horns represents the kingdom of Media and Persia. The goat represents the kingdom of Greece and the prominent horn between the eyes of the first king. The four horns that came up when the first horn was broken represents four kingdoms into which the nation will be divided and which will be not be as strong as the first kingdom. Okay, so who was that first horn there that conquered the world? Alexander. The Alexander the Great. And then his, he died at that young age over in Babylon in a drunken fit. Unfortunately, his son was killed away, was, didn't amount to anything, was destroyed, and then this, the generals fought over it. It's very unfortunate, though, even I've talked with an Adventist pastor who is not a pastor anymore, 
it says that 2300 day evening and morning is really it's really half uh, means 1150 so yeah 1150 and they put Antiochus Epiphanes that he was but that's really from the fourth kingdom it's so sad yeah. that uh, people gonna, all over the world are we're going to deal with that in just a moment you know sometimes the, the Latin old Latin I think says 2200 days and one of the Septuagint says uh, uh, 24 yeah Notice that the vision in Daniel 8 does not include any information about Babylon. It starts with Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome up to the end. It specifically says the end. Is that the end of the world? The end. Well, why didn't it include Babylon? Because Babylon was already almost Babylon gone. was already fallen when this vision was given. Yeah. The angel's explanation in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 talks about 70 weeks instead of the 70 years that Daniel was contemplating. He says, please, Lord, it's time for us to go back. And God says, no, let's talk about 70 weeks of years and so forth. Okay, so let's have a look here. Duane? Daniel 9.22. He, ex he explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. So he says specifically, this is what he's coming for. Okay, go ahead. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now let me interrupt there for a second. That gets a little complicated. It's possible to break these down and show how they apply to what happened, particularly with reference to the ministry of Jesus. And let's go ahead here and we'll see how this fits exactly, mathematically. Go ahead. Okay. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous, troublous times. Gordon? And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and on to the end of the war desolations are determined. Okay, so what you probably have detected here now, we're quoting now from the King James Version, these translators, not understanding exactly what they're talking about, are, are, are translating as literally as they can these words. So I thought we should look at these words literally, and we'll, we'll, we'll come to what they probably mean in a few moments. Okay? I'm going to continue there? Yes, please. Continuing from King James Version, verse 27, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. King okay. James Version. Okay, what do we know about these 70 weeks? Our Bible study guide says the 70 weeks of Daniel 9 are determined from the longer prophecy of the 2300 days. In Daniel 8, 14, the Hebrew word for determined appears only here in the Hebrew Old Testament. It can be literally translated cut off. The rabbis use this word to describe something severed or amputated from a longer period. Uh, from a longer period. Severance is precisely the meaning here. The future of the Jewish people, the temple in Jerusalem, are also outlined in this prophecy. The 70 weeks were to be a time of probation to restore Israel to full favor with God. During this period, the Messiah would come to bring in everlasting righteousness. That was in verse 24. And I can tell you, if, you, if we had an hour or two here, you can go and you could show exactly why you, know, you can show chronologically from the ancient documents, okay, it starts at 457, it goes down, and it just nails it down, one, one, one. 
So the question may be asked, what evidence do we have in the text itself that the 70 weeks are not literal weeks or 490 literal days? The Hebrew expression for weeks here is, is also used as a group of days and can be translated as 77s. And that's what it says literally. In the Hebrew, it, says, it doesn't say 70 weeks, it says 77s. And that word sevens is the Hebrew word for weeks. So it could be sevens, it could be weeks. Because the events prophesied take place in a much longer period than 490 days. We know for sure that there wasn't a time, you know, just maybe 490 days would be, what, what a year and a half, something like that? Uh, the, the Jewish people didn't come to an end in a year and a half, uh, obviously. Because the events prophesied take place in a much longer time, long, longer period than 490 literal days, and in fact span centuries. This time period must be understood in the context of the day-year principle, and we'll look at that in a moment. The day-year principle is spelled out in Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34. That is, one prophetic day equals one literal year. Now that's a principle that a lot of people don't understand. Um, okay, Jim? Gerhard Fendel of the Seventh-day Adventist Biblical Research Institute makes this insightful comment on Numbers 14, verse 34. God deliberately used a day for a year principle as a teaching device. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day, excuse me, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection, Numbers 1434, and in an acted out parable, the prophet Ezekiel was told to lie 395, excuse me, 390 days on his left side and 40 days on his right side. I have laid on, on you a day for a year, each year, Ezekiel 4, verse 6. However, Numbers 14 and Ezekiel 4 are not epipotent. Apolic, apolypt, apol apocalyptic. Oh, my, 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 that's terrible. Apocalyptic text. God therefore spells it out. One day standing for stands for a year, and apocalyptic text. This is, excuse me. In ap apocalyptic text, this is never stated. It is an underlying principle. The Journal of the Adventist Theological Society, number twenty-three, number one, from. 2012, page 9. The principle applies in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. This is from the Bible Study Guide. For Okay, so the reason we know that God chose to do things this way, which might seem strange to people, is that it works out exactly, mathematically. Okay, moving on here. When we calculate these prophecies using the day for a year principle, the time periods work out exactly. Gary? The 70 weeks of Daniel 9, 24, 25 compute to 490 prophetic days or 490 literal years. This 70 week period begins with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When Babylon was defeated by the Medes and the Persians, eventually the new rulers passed three separate decrees allowing the Jews to return from Babylonian captivity to Jerusalem. The first two decrees issued by Cyrus, and this is from Ezra 1, 1 through 4, and Darius, Ezra 6, 1 through 12, respectively, did not fully include each of the following. The rebuilding of Jerusalem, the restoration of the temple, and the legitimization of Israel as a judicial system. Okay, let me interrupt there. So what happens there is that the, the, the prophecy was given to Ezra. This decree from the king was given to us. We know if we read the book of Ezra, books of Ezra and Nehemiah what happened. Ezra went, went back there as a just judicial leader and the spiritual leader took a but then Nehemiah came with the authority of the Persian Empire and rebuilt this wall. In, and, and we'll see in a moment that the key issue is 
they were given permission to rebuild the wall. In other words, now they have a separate place that was safe for them to dwell. Before that, they were just at the mercy of any of the marauding tribes around them. Okay, go ahead. The uh, rebuilding of Jerusalem, the restoration of the temple, and the legitimization of Israel as a judicial system. The last of the three decrees issued by Artaxerxes in 457 BC not only allowed the Jewish people to return to their homeland, but it also provided provisions for them to do so and mandated the city of Jerusalem as their civil, judicial, and religious center. This is from Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 81 through 82. Okay, so it's that decree that finally allows them to be reestablished as a, as a government. They're still under the Persian control, but from the time of Satan's rebellion in heaven, the universe has been waiting for God to give his ultimate answer to Satan's challenges. Satan was cast out of heaven, but he managed to spread his rebellion to the earth, to this earth. How would God respond? God's answer, planned from before the creation of this world, if you remember our previous lessons, as we have already studied, was completed by the life and death of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus on Resurrection Sunday morning struck the death now to Satan's kingdom. Satan is still alive, but his ultimate death and loss in the great controversy is guaranteed. God wanted to make it clear that not only the first coming of Christ, but also this second coming would be in the plans. They're included in the plans. So Christ himself through Gabriel linked the first coming with a prophetic announcement of the second coming. So now let's see if we can figure that all out. The 2300 day year prophecy in Daniel 8:14 has been discussed almost without end for many years. What is it talking about, Charles? Some argue that the 2300 days are literal days. They also believe that the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 applies to Seleucid military leader Antiochus Epiphanes, 216 BC to 164 BC, who attacked Jerusalem and defiled the Jewish temple even though 2300 days does not fit even his, this time frame. His time frame that he was actually conquered Jerusalem yeah. was only about half of that. So he, in order to try to make that fit, you would have to say 1150 evenings and 1150 mornings, and it still doesn't fit. Okay, go ahead. Yes, this interpretation, however, is contrary to the angel's clear instruction that the vision applies to the time of the end. Antiochus Epiphanes certainly did not live in the time of the end. Yes. In Daniel chapter 8, Gabriel begins his explanation of the 2300 day prophecy. He, he names the ram as the representing Media Persia and the male goat as representing Greece. Daniel chapter 8, verse 21 and 22. Though not named, as are the two powers before it. The next entity, the little horn, is obviously Rome. He then depicts a kind Daniel, of... Daniel, the, the reference there is Daniel 8, 9, 9 23, and 24. Yes. Go ahead. He then depicts a kind of religio-political phase of Rome, which would cast down the truth to the ground. Daniel 8, uh, 10 through 12 and 25, and interfere with Christ's heavenly ministry, Daniel 8, 10 to 12, the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, 14, the climax of the character is God's answer to the challenge of earthly and religious powers that have attempted to usurp the authority of God. It is part of God's divine solution to the sin problem, adult sub school Bible lesson. For Monday, May 1. May 1. This, you know, it's possible that the Catholic Church has its finger in getting uh, the uh, thoughts of the Protestant Church twisted mm. so that uh, the Antichrist is really not in the picture. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Jesuits have done this in they other try. places as well. It's very possible that yeah. they're doing this and the 
the Protestant church has picked on this. Okay, Duane, let's look at these actual verses so that we can see what it says here. Daniel 8, there, 10, 20, and... Yeah. Daniel 8, 20, 21. The ram you saw that had two horns represents the kingdoms of Media and Persia. The goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the prominent horn between his eyes is the first king. Now this was written way before the days of Alexander himself. So, in fact, you may know the story. When Alexander the, came down through there with his conquered powers, remember he went all the way down into Egypt. When he came through, uh, Jew, came through Israel, or, or Palestine at that point in time, the Jewish leaders went out there and said, look at this. You're, you're, what, you're coming here was prophesied in our Bible. You know, welcome, come on, you can pass through, we're not going to fight with you, which was a huge improvement. I mean, otherwise, Alexander would probably have wiped them out. But they said, God prophesied that you're going to come. And so he was so amazed, yeah, look at that. So he just passed on his way and conquered Egypt instead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Daniel 8, 9 to 24. Out of the one of these four horns grew a little horn, whose power extended towards the south and the east and towards the promised land. When the end of these kingdoms was near, and they have become so wicked that they must be punished, there will be a stubborn, vicious, and deceitful king. He will grow strong, but not by his own power. He will cause terrible destruction to and be successful in everything that he does. He will bring destruction on powerful men and on God's own people. Good wow. Bible. Okay, Gordon. In Daniel 8, verses 10 to 12 and 25. It grew strong enough to attack the army of heaven, the stars themselves, and it threw some of them to the ground and trampled on them. It even defied the prince of the heavenly army stopped the daily sacrifices offered to him and desecrated the temple. People sinned there instead of offering the proper daily sacrifices and true religion was thrown to the ground. The horn was successful in everything it did. Okay, before we move on, what are we talking about here? The conquest of Jerusalem by the Roman power, right? And of course, it continued to fight against anything that was not according to its authority right through, down through history, changed from that Roman imperial power to the Roman uh, church power later. Go ahead. Verse 25, because he is cunning, he will succeed in his deceitful ways. He will be proud of himself and destroy many people without warning. He will even defy the greatest king of all, but he will be destroyed without the use of any human power. Good News Bible. Okay, when we say he will defy the greatest king of all, what, is, what are we talking about? He will defy God. Okay. There's a crown that the Pope doesn't very often wear, but he does sometimes, and it has three levels of sort of circles around it. Do you know what that says on there? Vicarious Filii Dei. Vicarious Filii Dei. What does that mean? Vicar of the Son of... God. Substitute for the Son of God. That says right on his crown there. Gabriel is ready to explain the details in God's prophetic timetable. At the end of Daniel 8, we can clearly see that Daniel did not understand the part of the vision about the 2300 days. The earlier part about the ram, the goat, and the little horn had all been explained, even with the first two powers outright identified by name, Daniel 8, 20 and 21. The cleansing of the sanctuary was, however, not explained. We have discovered that, and that's from our Bible study guide from Monday, May 1, we have discovered that the only part of the prophecy which was not explained by Gabriel is the 2300 days. What did Gabriel tell Daniel and us about that? The second appearance by Gabriel was specifically to help Daniel understand the prophecy in Daniel 8, 14. Gabriel continued his record in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, as in item number 14 above. What events in the life and ministry of Jesus is this about? So now, remember, Daniel was praying, Lord, you promised 70 years. And then he gets this message for 2,300 years, and then 490 years is cut off somehow. So 
we already know about the day year principle. These are just two examples in the Old Testament which suggest that in prophetic situations, one day stands for one literal year. Jim? Well, the Bible study guide, Gabriel d tells Daniel that 400 years are cut off. 490, 490 years. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> Um, the literal meaning of the Hebrew word shaktok, sh shaktok yeah, that's whatever, right. sometimes translated determined, cut off from what? It only could be the other, excuse me, it could be, it could only be the other time prophecy alluded to here, the 2300 days of Daniel 814. These 490 years which are a time prophecy, are directly linked back to the time prophecy of Daniel 8.14. The only part of the vision left unexplained in Daniel 8, and the only time prophecy in Daniel 8 as well. Thus, we can see that Gabriel with his prophecy is coming to help Daniel understand what he is, didn't understand in the previous chapters, the 2300 days, this is from the Bible study guide for May 2nd. Okay, now, um, there's something that they haven't talked about in here which is important for those people who really want to see all the details. It's only in talking about the 490 years that it gives us a clue that it begins with the restoration, rebuilding of Jerusalem. So now we're going to say 490 years has been cut off from 2300 days so now that means the two prophecies have to begin at the same time, right? You can't, if you cut something off, it has to start at the same time. You, you have to cover, you have to either cut it, off, cut it off from the beginning or you have to cut it off from the end. You can't cut a chunk out of the middle. So we use that 490 year prophecy to determine the time when it began and we'll talk about that right now. I need to make a quick call. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, you know, just mentioned a little while ago, vicarious philidii, the three mm -hmm. tired, going through Adventist school system into college. I mean, this was this, uh, talked about, it, talked about it. We knew it by heart. Suddenly, this church does not talk very much about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Is it that it's going to be soon that we will really start talking again? Well. The attitude has been now, if we, if we try to say too much about the Roman Catholic Church, then we're going to turn off Catholics we might be wanting to win. And uh, that's sort of the attitude. But I agree with you. We need to, certainly the time is coming where we have to be very clear on that once again. Of our kids even today know that there's a book called Great Controversy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gabriel began this 490-year prophecy with an event that was extremely important to Daniel and to the Jews, the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Although various decrees had been passed regarding Jerusalem in Ezra 7, we discover that the decree passed in 457 BC allowed the Jews not only to return to their homeland, but also to establish themselves as a religious community. Okay. Where are we? That's me. Ezra 7, 13 and 27, Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites who volunteer to go to Jerusalem, with you may go. So he's talking to Ezra specifically. Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put it in the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way. That's from the New International Version. The key words are in the middle of this decree, Ezra 7, 18, what does it say, Jim? Whatever seems good for, whatever seems good to you and your colleagues, do with the rest of the silver and gold you may do according to the will of your God. From the Bible, okay. Revised Standard Version. So he says you need to finish building the the temple. You must spend a certain amount of, of the money on sacrifices and offerings and pray for my, my, myself and my son, children. But then whatever money is left over, you can use it for what? Whatever you choose. Well, what do you suppose the people in Jerusalem, what do they want to do? Pay for the repair of the wall, right? So this is the restoring of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. That's the way we peg that date, 457 B.C. 
Daniel, Daniel longed all these years to go, but did he really go with this group? We don't, we don't know, we don't have any good evidence that Daniel ever returned to, ba to, to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He's praying for it, but we don't have any evidence that he ever actually made it. There actually is a tomb site in Jerusalem that some of you may have heard about that has scratched on the wall, carved into the rock, a picture of someone being thrown down into a pit with a group of lions. Mm -hmm. And is that someone just thinking about the Daniel story is or could it be possible that Daniel came back and maybe even was buried there that's another possibility i will tell you that the people over in 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 iran they will tell you this is where daniel is buried they have a monument to his burial there so they don't think he made it back to jerusalem for whatever that's worth. When was that memorial built? Oh, uh, it was built... Um, recently? No, no, not re it was It was partially restored recently, but it was built, I've forgotten, quite a long time ago. It, the, the original one got destroyed and uh, mostly destroyed and they rebuilt it. They built a nice new one now, but the original one was way back, I think even BC. This is the one in Jerusalem or no no the one in, in the one in, in Iran. Iran. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So these were the words that allowed the Jews the Jews to rebuild things in Jerusalem. We, as we read in, read in Daniel 9:25. Where are we? Who's Is it me? We read. Okay. Daniel 9:25. Note this and understand it from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes. Seven times, seven years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses and will stand for seven times, 62 years. But this will be a time of troubles. And this is from the Good News Bible. Okay, this decree, including... Ezra 7.18 was given to Ezra, who took it to Jerusalem with him. He carried this decree from the emperor. This was the emperor's decree that gives us this detail. Okay, Charles? Daniel 9.27. He shall make a strong no, covenant. No, uh, start with the 26. It is possible. Right. Daniel 9.26, after the 62... No, no, even before that, it is possible to calculate than previous paragraph. Okay, it is possible to calculate exactly this decree was given in the autumn of five, 457 BC. About, and nine, 490 years later brings us to AD 27, the year in which Jesus was baptized. That was his anointing. The story of Jesus' baptism is familiar as quoted in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 to 17. Okay, so, Duane? After the 62 sevens, <clears throat> the appointed one will be so, put... I just want to point out here, this translation uh, chooses, the New International Version, chooses to use the word sevens as opposed to weeks. Okay, you see. This is also in the original writing. This is the, the original writings. Right. The word can mean sevens, it can mean weeks. weeks. Right. Right. Okay. After the 62 sevens, the, appoint, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. Footnote, or death, but not for himself. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Okay, we know that the destruction of Jerusalem came like a flood, didn't it? So we see that at the end of the 69 weeks of years, Jesus was baptized in the middle of the 70th week. Three and a half years later, uh, in AD 31, he was crucified. At the end of that 70th week, in AD 34, Stephen was stoned and the gospel was taken to the Gentiles so the end of the special uh, relationship to the Jewish nation came. Notice the specific words in Daniel 9, 27. He shall make a strong covenant 
with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall make a sacrifice and offerings, offering cease. He will make sacrifice and offering cease. And in their place shall be an abomination of desolate until the decreed end is poured out upon the desolator. It's a okay. new revised standard version. Yeah. Okay. So I chose that one again to make it a little bit clearer, I hope, this understanding. Uh, who was it that destroyed the temple in Jerusalem? Titus? What? Well, it was Titus, yeah, but he was a, a head of the Roman armies, the Roman company. And what happened after that? Within a few decades, uh, the Jews, I mean, the Romans moved in. They, de they determined to completely decimate any Jewish traces of Jewish religion. They built their Roman temple on the site of, of where the te Jewish temple used to be, that of course was gone by this time, and completely changed, they even changed the name of Jerusalem to Capitolium, so forth. So they were trying to completely wipe away any trace of the Jewish. There was another one, uh, Hadrian. And yeah, that was Hadrian. 135 yep. AD, he came and yep. destroyed everything, you know. Uh, well, as we know, at the time of Christ's crucifixion, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, Mark 15, 38. That was a sign that sacrifices, that type of literal sacrifices, were to cease. So now we can see that the first 490 years of this 200, 300-year prophecy applied to the Jewish people particularly and pointed to the story of the Messiah. At the beginning of the 70th week, he was baptized. In the middle of the week, he was crucified. At the end of the week, in AD 34, God proclaimed that the gospel should go to the Gentiles. And how did that actually happen? Do you remember? How, how was the gospel sent to the Gentiles? There was, a, there was a severe persecution of Christians. And the Christians, so what happened? The scriptures scattered, the Christians scattered, and what do they do? Took the they spread the gospel wherever they went. So if we subtract 490 from 2300, we find there are 1810 years left, and that was, that, add that to AD 34, and we come to 1844. So what was supposed to happen in 1844? What is suggested in the cleansing of the sanctuary? What does that, what does that mean? And the ancient sanctuary built in the desert at the foot of Mount Sinai and following on thereafter, an annual ceremony took place in the fall of the year known as Yom Kippur. You've all heard that. They, even, they use that term fairly often. Even you hear it on the TV and radio sometimes. Or what we now call the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 and 23 give us the details. So what happened at that point of time? For three days, the people were to prepare themselves very carefully, getting clean and delaying, I'm sorry, dealing with their sins as far as possible. Then on the Day of Atonement, and the, high, the high priest symbolically carried those sins into the most holy place in the sanctuary. From there, symbolically, the sins were carried out and placed on the head of the scapegoat and symbolically completely removed from the people of Israel. So, I mean, we, we don't offer sacrificial animals anymore, but you can imagine how people who were accustomed to that kind of thing, imagine a child, he says, no, okay, I, I went there and I confessed my sins on the head of the lamb, the blood was carried into the tabernacle, there it is, and then on the Day of Atonement, there's this elaborate ceremony, and then they see the, the priest place his hands on the head of the scapegoat, and someone with that soap rope around the neck of that scapegoat takes it off in the desert, and the children of Israel say, okay, there go our sins. It was a very concrete thing, but that's the way they understood it. Okay? So how does that apply to us? The same thing was supposed to happen starting in 1844. What is known as a pre-advent judgment or the investigative judgment is still taking place right now. The sins of God's people must be removed and dealt with in the heavenly record so that all the beings who live in heaven and throughout the rest of the universe are satisfied that what God is doing is right. When that process is finished, Christ will return at his second coming. 
And if we had time, we would review the fact that God doesn't come, that process doesn't come to an end until everyone on this earth has made a choice, either for God or against him. Since 1844, we have been living in the judgment hour, and Revelator, Revelation's message of the first angel proclaims what? The hour of his judgment has come. How then do we today afflict our souls? The Bible study guide has this summary regarding the 70 week prophecy. Here's a quick and easy way to look at the 70 week prophecy. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. What do we read there? First, there are 70 weeks, Daniel okay. 9, 24. Next, there are seven weeks and 62 weeks or 69 weeks, Daniel 9, 25 of the 70 weeks. There is the last week, the 70th, Daniel 9, 27. And finally, the last week is divided, quote, in the middle of the week, end quote, Daniel 9, 27, into two three and a half year sections. That's it, 70 weeks, which are composed of 69 weeks and one week. And that one week is divided in half. Just plug in the date, 457 BC at the beginning. And with simple math, yes, we come to 1844 on that timeline. Okay, and some of you know that uh, there was a problem when this was calculated. Well, I, we'll, we'll, we'll read a little bit about it here in just a moment. Also in describing the 2300, days, Daniel 8 never said when the 2300 days began. Quote, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Unto 2300 days, from what time? Why not from the time when Daniel had the vision itself, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, in our Bible study guide for Friday. It is possible to calculate exactly the 15th year of the ruler of emperor, the, the rule of Emperor Tiberius when the Bible says Jesus went to John to be baptized. An actual fact, it's interesting if you look at the, the experience, the emperor prior to Tiberius was really the one that's in charge of the entire Roman Empire. But just exactly 15 years before Jesus was baptized, that man took his son Tiberius and said, I want you to be in charge of this area around Jerusalem. So, and you can, that's all can be documented from the Roman records. So, what do we have that tells us where, what happened at that time? Luke 3, 21 to 22, it was the 15th year of the rule of the Emperor Tiberius. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and that he's been documented historically as well from extra biblical sources. Herod was ruler of Galilee, we know about him. And his brother Philip was ruler of the territory of Eturia and Trachonitis. Lysanias was ruler of Abilene and Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. At that time, and we have, we have extra biblical evidence for each one of these individuals. It's amazing. We have the coffin, I mean, actually the bone box that Caiaphas was buried in. His bones were buried in. Remember in those days, they would bury somebody and then after a year or so and their, all the flesh and so forth is deteriorated, they would come and carefully collect up the, the bones and put them in one of these smaller bone boxes and move them out of the way so somebody else can be buried in that spot. Okay, at that time, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the desert. So John went throughout the whole territory of the river Jordan, preaching, turn away from your sins and be baptized and God will forgive your sins. People's hopes began to rise and they began to wonder whether John perhaps might be the Messiah. So John said to all of them, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am. I'm not good enough even to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. After all the people had been baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in a bodily form like a dove. And what, what, do, what we're told that prophetically is going to happen at the end of that time period, there was an anointing, right? And how do anointings take place? To, traditionally, there it's olive oil that's placed on someone's head. But in this case, Jesus is anointed with what? What did I just read? The Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. So that was the heavenly anointing. 
and a voice came from heaven, you are my own dear son, I am pleased with you. So we have all three members of the Godhead present there. And then we come, we, well, we know about what happened, in, but we come to Acts 8, 1, and Saul approved of his murder. You remember the whole story? That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the province of Judea and Samaria. And some devout man, it goes on. Okay, any questions about that? Stephen was stoned and Paul, formerly known as Saul, was determined to destroy all Christians. As we know, sometime later, Saul had that experience on the road to Damascus and became the foremost Christian evangelist. Thus, the gospel was to be spread to Jews first and also to Gentiles. And there's that whole Romans 1, all this is spelled out in there. He was not on salary. He was not on salary. Yes, sir. <laughs> he was. Neither were the 12 disciples, and 10 of them died at the hands of others, and so did Paul. Yeah. So that day is coming. Yeah. And we have to be ready. Yeah. Uh, worse than any, any time before it. Yes, sir. So in summary, what do we know? I can get my computer to wake up here for me. Well, in summary, to me, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. I mean, the biblical, extra-biblical Jesus was. Yeah. Jim? Well, the Bible is called the guide. The entire yeah. prophecy begins with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in 4 457 B.C., Daniel 9.25. If you begin at 457 B.C. and move forward 2300 years on history's timeline, including the move from 1 B.C. to A.D. 1, which does not include a year zero. You arrive at 1844. This date ushers in a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven and the working of the judgment prefigured by the Day of Atonement. From the Bible Study Guide, page 83. So, what have we learned in the last few seconds we have here from this careful reading of the scriptures? The Bible can be trusted. It is mathematically precise, it's accurate in all of its details. Okay, and I'm going to jump down here. Second, the judgment with judgment hour message is an appeal to our hearts to strive for a deeper commitment to Jesus as Lord of our lives. And then number three, the urgency of the hour is a call for God's people to witness. The urgency, uh, I'm sorry, with renewed fervency to their relatives, friends, neighbors, and working associates. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these detailed things that we have to struggle sometimes to work it out, but we can see that they, the dates work out exactly. May we remember the implications of all this and prepare as you've suggested that we should for that glorious day soon when you will come again is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.